The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The, the wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it, is, where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Thanks be to God. Well, I am that Bob Miller that Nancy introduced and said would be your preacher today. Um, I haven't been here in a long time. Uh, not since the renovation, and I have to tell you, I liked the brick. <laughs> and and uh, we were talking before church about the changes, and someone said, I don't like the light back here or something, and somebody else doesn't like the light. And I said, well, this is church. We never satisfy everybody. So this is also quite nice. It seemed like when I was here before the pulpit was over on that side. So I sat down here. You know, I don't know what I'm doing here, so I didn't know when I was supposed to come in or where I was supposed to sit, so I just came in and sat down. And I, I've never had this view before. So a different perspective, and maybe that's kind of what Nicodemus is getting out of this scripture, is a different perspective, a different way to see God. So let's begin with Nicodemus. Just who was this guy? Well, we know from this reading that he was a leader of the Jews. And then later in chapter 7, we would learn that he was actually a Pharisee. He had heard of Jesus, and he was inspired by the things he had heard about him. And Rather than seeing Jesus as an enemy of the temple, he thought 
that if all he had heard was true, that Jesus might actually have been sent by God. And that he wanted to meet personally with Jesus rather than judge him on the hearsay shows that Nicodemus was a man of integrity and that he came to Jesus at night shows that he also understood that he was going against the will of the other Pharisees and Jewish leaders. And he was risking his reputation and his rank. Also in chapter 7, we find Jesus in Jerusalem with his disciples to celebrate the festival of booze which is on the 15th day of the seventh month to commemorate the wilderness wanderings of Exodus. The Pharisees want to see him arrested for the things he was saying, and they deemed him to be seditious. But Nicodemus reminds them that their law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing. And for that, he was ridiculed by his colleagues. Then finally, after the crucifixion, we hear of Nicodemus one more time. He accompanies Joseph of Arimathea to respect and honor Jesus. He prepares the body of Jesus for burial. He has come to respect and honor Jesus so much that by that juncture, at the end of our story, he willingly and openly risks the position of power and he commits himself to Jesus. The Pharisees were an ancient Jewish sect distinguished by strict observation of traditional and written law. So back at the festival of, festival of Jews, when Nicodemus reminded them that our law doesn't allow us to judge until we've given the accused a hearing, That should speak directly to the Pharisees, but that's not what they want to hear at that time. The Pharisees were commonly held to have the pretensions of superiority and sanctity. We are the holy people. They believed that a right standing with God is earned through close adherence to the letters of the laws of the Torah. God demands righteousness, and those who don't behave are smited, that is, punished. Well, this man Jesus was a perfect example in their minds of misbehavior. It's kind of interesting in the chronology of John's gospel. Jesus first gets baptized by John, and then he gathers his first disciples, Peter and Andrew, and Philip and Nathaniel. And then the next story in the gospel of John is the wedding at Cana, where Jesus turns the water into wine. And then, just a few days later, he goes to Jerusalem for the Passover. And at that point, in John's Gospel, he overturns the tables, drives out the money changers and the merchants with a whip of cords. It's only in John that you have that violence of the whip. The other Gospels put that event of driving out the money changers, cleansing the temple, 
at, at, during the Passover, they all put that at the end of the story, just the day prior to crucifixion. But we don't know. So, so that causes a confusion for us. Did, it, did that happen at the beginning of the story as John has it or at the end of the story as the other Gospels put it? However it happened, it was kind of the last straw for the Pharisees. This man is a problem. It may be that Nicodemus and the rest of the Pharisees, even if this was at the beginning of the story, already knew more about Jesus than John gives them credit for. They may have had enough information to know that Jesus played loosely with the law that they so respected. He healed on the Sabbath. He dined with sinners. He welcomed outcasts. So surely Jesus deserved punishment. It bothered them even more than his disregard of the law that he was becoming more and more popular with the people. So he was an obvious threat to the authority of the temple and the leaders of the Jews. He deserved to be punished or at least disciplined. In other words, can't you see that the Pharisees were what we would call Jewish fundamentalists. And it's been said that religious fundamentalism in any faith is the greatest threat to world peace. So, for Nicodemus to honor scripture as he did and allow that Jesus might be the fulfillment of God's messianic thrust represented a Radical change. Whenever it happened, it was right after Jesus' angry rant in the temple that Nicodemus sought him out. We don't know whether Nicodemus had ever heard Jesus preach. We're only told that he had heard of the miracles that Jesus had performed and it intrigued him enough to want to meet Jesus himself. What he had heard from Jesus was a different kind of relationship with God. Nicodemus asked Jesus about the miracles he had done. And I kind of chuckle at the way Jesus sort of disregards the question and says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. It's no wonder that Jesus spoke of being reborn. He saw something new emerging in Nicodemus. The story, story that we read today about Nicodemus is a story of a different kind of birth, a birth of the Spirit, a reawakening, a conversion to a new identity of his personal relationship to God and therefore to a new life. Nick doesn't understand. He knows the only one kind of birth, which is from a mother's womb. So Jesus tries again. Very truly, I tell you that no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What's he mean by that? I'm sure Nicodemus was asking the same question. 
So it refers back to the Bible that Nicodemus and Jesus both knew very well. Genesis tells us a wind from God blew over the face of the deep and the, the, over the face of the waters and the earth was born. But note in that story, the story just fascinates me, in the creation story, the wind blew over the face of the waters, the water's already there as though it's not really created by God. So it is the essence of God. Water is part of what God uses to create everything. And Genesis and science agree that the earliest life forms emerged from water. The water of the Red Sea parts and the Israelites are given new hope and new life. Mother's water breaks and the baby is born. We are all born of water. But we are also born of spirit. Last Sunday we wore red and celebrated Pentecost in memory of the day when the Holy Spirit blew into the assembly of Jews from all over the world and gave birth to the Christian church. The Spirit blew in like the wind from God blew over the face of the deep. Spirit is a windy word. Think of school spirit. It's stirred up by the cheerleaders who bring the student body together in pride and support of their specific community. And with that spirit, the community performs better than they could without it. And each individual performs better because of the spirit. So spirit has influence. The spirit of a person no longer living can continue to influence the behavior of succeeding generations. Think how grandmother still influences you. In some circumstances, that spirit of the departed is referred to as a ghost. And the spirit of the living Christ is known archaically as Holy Ghost. It's kind of a good term because spirit is invisible. It has no substance, but it is powerful because it has energy. It can energize a whole group of people to accomplish so much more than any one individual ever could or the whole community to do more than they could without spirit. So that's what happened at Pentecost when the disciples had Jesus with them. They were followers who depended on him. But when he was no longer with them, they had spirit, and they became leaders. They, with spirit, were emboldened to tell others the truth of their personal experience with Jesus. With spirit, they became courageous, unafraid to speak truth to power, and fearless of the persecution that they might experience because of it. Jesus had taught them that God would use everything that happens, good or bad, to bring about the ultimate kingdom of the divine. When Jesus told Nicodemus that in order to see the kingdom, 
We must be born of both water and spirit. He was saying that we are both human and divine. And if we do not recognize that God part of ourself, we will never recognize that we live in and are part of the kingdom of God. With that recognition, or I'm sorry, without that recognition, we are doomed to respect God as judge and discipline, disciplinarian who punishes human wrongs. The law and the commandments are our only hope of knowing what God expects of us. That defines the Pharisees. But when we know the spirit within and appreciate that we are created in the image of God, then everything changes as it did for Nicodemus. Well, let's just skip over chapter or verse 16 of this reading because we know it so well that we probably should dwell on it because knowing it so well, we probably misunderstand it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's focus instead on the final verse of this reading. Verse 17, indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Pharisees saw God as judgmental and condemning. The story of Nicodemus and his association with Jesus and his eventual accepting and following Jesus shows us that being born from above, knowing the Holy Spirit dwells within us, is to be saved from the debilitating fear of the Lord's punishment we are free to explore beyond the letter of the law, free to make mistakes and learn from them. Indeed, we are free to experience God's forgiveness and love and grace. We are given a new chance at life. We are reborn from above. Amen.